1968, the United States sent a spy ship to the Sea of Japan. Under the guise of conducting environmental research, they were aiming to intercept communications from North Korea. But at some point, a North Korean vessel appeared. They demanded that the Americans identified themselves. They followed protocol. They raised the American flag and two civilian oceanographers explained that they were just conducting research. But the North Koreans didn't buy it and they demanded to come aboard. But with the entire lower deck of the American ship filled with surveillance equipment, they knew that this wasn't an option. So they fled. This started a two hour chase and they were firing with live ammunition at the Americans. As hard as the Americans tried, they were eventually forced to surrender. The North Koreans have seized a U.S. Navy ship with 82 men aboard and have taken it into a North Korean port. The capture of an American ship. The alleged intrusions are completely false. Behind the facade of an international media frenzy, the United States intelligence agencies were working around the clock. Lyndon B. Johnson was the president of the United States. He was briefed on what would be called the Pueblo Incident. In this first memo, it says that the ship's closest point of approach to North Korean territory was 13 nautical miles, which contradicts North Korea's claim that it entered its territorial water. The Arms Special Pueblo, which conducted espionage acts after intruding deep into the territorial waters of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Complete fabrications and entirely false. The CIA believed that North Korea captured the Pueblo for propaganda both at home and abroad. The president's first order was to not create obstacles to a diplomatic solution by facing North Koreans with military actions. But that sentiment quickly changed. Their index of possible actions included reconnaissance missions, electronic jamming operations, a show of force, airstrikes, a raid across the demilitarized zone, and so forth. Those plans were quickly extended to a nuclear contingency plan with the goal to neutralize the North Korean Air Force. The situation remained tense for months until almost a year later, the captive Americans were released. A lot of Americans don't realize how lucky they are. During this year, 1968, some feared another Korean War. Now, if they fail to deliver this ship and its crew at the appointed hour, I would be positive that one of their cities would disappear from the face of the earth and do it. But it didn't happen. Then again, in the 1990s, the two countries almost went to war. Three administrations have tried to bring this nuclear program under international control. There is nothing more important to our security and to the world's stability. Thank you very much. Are you taking military steps tonight? But they didn't. Then again, in the early 2000s. North Korea is a regime arming with missiles and weapons of mass destruction while starving its citizens. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil. You might think that the reason why the United States didn't intervene militarily as it did in Iraq is because North Korea has nukes, the ultimate deterrent. But let me remind you that they conducted their first nuclear test in 2006. So something else must be going on. This is why North Korea is untouchable with hindsight. When the Korean Peninsula was engulfed in the Korean War, the United States was far ahead with its nuclear technology. We now know exactly how close they actually came to using the bomb. The Korean Peninsula was divided after World War II. The North was communist and the South capitalist. Both wanted reunification on their own terms, but the negotiation was going nowhere. So in June 1950, North Korea decided to leverage its military advantage. They crossed the border into South Korea, starting the Korean War. They were incredibly successful and rapidly gained terrain. 
two months into the operation, South Korea was on the brink of defeat. And in this moment, the United Nations contributed an army to help South Korea. This was for 90% made up of American soldiers. They launched an amphibious attack near Seoul and simultaneously attacked from the south. And in just a matter of weeks, they reached the border with China. At this moment, the Chinese decided to join North Korea in combat. They were preparing an army of 200,000 soldiers, which made the United States reasonably anxious. Of the government. Harry S. Truman, at that time president of the United States, was the only president who had ever authorized the use of nuclear weapons. Five years earlier, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, those were delivered with the B-29 Super Fortress, which were the only planes at that time that could deliver the enormous plutonium bombs. But after Japan, they were retired. The planes were underpowered, had frequent engine fires and used outdated propeller engines. But Truman was deeply concerned with the expected involvement of the Chinese in the Korean War. The American people had overwhelmingly supported US intervention in Korea at the start of the war, with 78% being in favor. But only six months later, that number had already dropped to only 38%. Truman needed a quick way out, especially now that they were still on the winning hand. So he ordered 10 retired B-29 aircrafts to be flown into the military base in Guam. Each airplane was carrying an atomic bomb that was similar in size as the one that was dropped on Nagasaki. This was the first time since 1945 that atomic weapons were transferred to military custody. In a press conference, President Truman said, we will take whatever steps are necessary to meet the military situation. To which a reporter asked, will that include the atomic bomb? And he responded, that includes every weapon that we have. The Chinese had of course heard these warnings and they had noticed the nuclear buildup in Guam, but it wasn't enough. With around 200,000 soldiers, they entered the war on North Korea's side. This gave the North Koreans a huge edge, and the front line shifted towards the border of North and South Korea at the start of the war. Around that time, Truman ordered the B-29s to be deployed in Okinawa. He ordered the bombs to be ready for use, meaning that the nuclear course would be installed. The US Air Force then conducted several runs using dummy nuclear weapons to train for an actual attack on North Korea. But as the war was reaching a stalemate, the Americans never followed through on these plans. Historians theorize that Truman chose not to use the weapons out of fear of escalation to a third world war, but also because their allies opposed its use and for the lack of urban centers that they can target in North Korea. In 1953, they signed an armistice agreement, which led to the creation of the border as we know it today. Truman left office and Eisenhower became president. Declassified memos show that the planning of a nuclear engagement continued and that the United States actively lobbied with its allies for placing nuclear weapons in East Asia. The Koreas, in the first decades after the war, were reinventing themselves. North Korea inherited much of the country's infrastructure, heavy industry and fertile farmlands. In the first decades, it seemed much more likely that they would develop into a prosperous industrial state. South Korea's economy was for 80% made up of American aid. The United States paid for their military and for rebuilding their basic infrastructure after the war. But despite this massive investment, the country was deeply corrupt and for the first two decades after the war, they showed little sustained economic growth. North and South Korea were going head to head. With the North Korean economy growing slightly faster, but they were praised for their free housing programs and free healthcare. Their life expectancy at that time was comparable to some of the most advanced nations in the world. 
while in South Korea, the market-oriented democracy that the United States was hoping to build was on a trajectory to becoming a failed autocratic state. In North Korea, Kim Il-sung was selected by the Soviet Union to become the absolute leader. He initially had strong ties with both China and the Soviet Union, but in the aftermath of the Korean War, the Juche philosophy came to dominate his politics. This translates to self-reliance, and the concept emphasizes independence and sovereignty as principles to guide the nation's politics, economy and defense. In the mid-1970s, something changed. North Korea's economy stagnated, while South Korea's rate of economic growth went through the roof. This was caused by multiple factors. North Korea had aligned itself more with China, upon which the Soviet Union decided to reduce its support, while at the same time the United States was putting more military pressure on the region, which forced North Korea to spend more on its defense. South Korea, in the meantime, made a series of good decisions. They used foreign aid to support heavy industry, electronics and steel industries. They provided support to domestic industries, which fostered the growth of companies such as Samsung and the Hyundai. The export took off, consumer confidence grew and the economy developed at a record pace. This unequal pace of development made reunification an even less likely prospect. South Korea now had one of the biggest economies in the world, but they had systematic problems with corruption and the country was led by increasingly authoritarian leaders. This led to massive protests to break out in 1987. But after that, the country underwent reforms and they enjoyed even more economic growth while North Korea's economy completely collapsed. This sheer unbalance on the peninsula was perceived by the United States as a threat. On December 24, 1991, Kim Jong-il was named commander-in-chief after his father fell ill. The very next day, the Soviet Union was dissolved. This meant that the aid to North Korea had now virtually dried up. Kim Jong-il replaced the leading political philosophy to a concept called Son Gun, or military first. This effectively meant that the military was more important than any other element in society. These events were closely followed by the CIA. Kim Jong-il had taken over many duties from his father, but Kim Il-sung was still North Korea's supreme leader. He had always wanted to possess nuclear weapons. In 1984, he had begun testing rockets that could potentially carry these warheads. These were still short-range missiles, but tests were later conducted more frequently and with missiles capable of reaching targets at longer distances. First, an update on where matters George H.W. Bush was president and he was tasked with containing the threat. In talks with South Korea, they agreed that the development of North Korea of nuclear weapons posed a gravely serious threat and that nuclear weapons in North Korean hands are intolerable. Bush had previously set out to denuclearize the Korean peninsula, but with these developments in the north, he decided to stall this for now. When Clinton came to office in 1993, the situation truly escalated. That year, North Korea renounced the nuclear arms treaty. One of the main reasons was the North Koreans' refusal to open nuclear sites for inspectors. The world collectively disapproved and punished North Korea with sanctions, after which they announced that they won't pull out of the arms pact now, that inspections could continue, but sites that were linked to the production of nuclear weapons would likely stay off limits. In the following weeks, North Korea allowed for some inspections, but not of all facilities. The United States responded by sending massive military reinforcements to South Korea, while simultaneously in secret, they were planning to invade North Korea. The Pentagon made plans to strike a small nuclear reactor at Yongbyon. This would prevent North Korea from recovering the raw material that was necessary to make a nuclear bomb. 
President Clinton said in his memoirs that he was determined to prevent North Korea from developing a nuclear arsenal, even at the risk of war. He felt that it was the last opportunity for the world to prevent North Korea from becoming a nuclear power. Such a strike on North Korea would almost certainly have resulted in war. This wasn't in the interest of South Korea and neither in that of China. China has maintained the policy of three no's. No war, no instability and no nukes. But their priority is stability and peace. They fear that the conflict would result in a massive flow of refugees into China and that the contamination from biological or nuclear warfare would spread to Chinese cities. Before the plan of attacking North Korean nuclear sites could be carried out, ex-president Jimmy Carter made a phone call. He spoke with Kim Il-sung, after which he agreed to freeze the North Korean nuclear program in return for US aid to meet North Korea's demand for energy. This was the closest that the two nations had come to war since 1953. A few months later, Kim Il-sung died and Kim Jong-il formally became North Korea's supreme leader. His leadership was characterized by severe economic mismanagement. Their foreign aid had mostly dried up and strict international sanctions made importing goods extremely challenging. Then came a period of extreme rainfall. And this was coupled with decades of poor land management, causing severe floods. This resulted in harvests to fail nationwide and hundreds of thousands of North Koreans starved to death. The nuclear crisis was over for now, but the Clinton administration continued to consider military intervention. In the time of the nuclear crisis in North Korea, Clinton's defense minister said, we planned for war with the combined forces of the Republic of Korea and the United States. We can undoubtedly win the war, but this involves many casualties and I will do my best to avoid war. South Korea foresaw enormous damage on Seoul and its president had no desire to undermine or absorb the North. But the United States saw the risk that a starving North Korea might become unstable and create a dangerously chaotic situation. If the US were to strike, this was the moment. But in moments of crises, the North Korean leadership goes on a charm offensive. Kim Jong-il's reputation in South Korea in the late 1990s began to improve. During his visits to China, he moved with such confidence and ease. The perception of him being an unpredictable madman was being challenged, and this created a mood of optimism in the South that a genuine negotiation and a potential breakthrough was actually possible. Clinton too held hope for a diplomatic solution. But when President Bush came into office, he terminated all talks with the North. In his 2002 State of the Union address, he made his stance very clear. North Korea is a regime arming with missiles and weapons of mass destruction while starving its citizens. Iran aggressively pursues these weapons and exports terror, while an unelected few repress the Iranian people's hope for freedom. The Iraqi regime has plotted to develop anthrax and nerve gas and nuclear weapons for over a decade. These regimes pose a grave and growing danger. They could provide these arms to terrorists, giving them the means to match their hatred. They could attack our allies or attempt to blackmail the United States. Out of Iraq, Iran and North Korea, North Korea was by far the biggest threat to the United States. Their army was more than twice the size as that of Iraq. It was better equipped, it had an impressive naval and air force, and their nuclear program was far more advanced. American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. But yet, he chose to invade Iraq and negotiate with North Korea. And this decision to seek a diplomatic solution with North Korea was broadly supported by the American people. 
But around the same time, Kim Jong-il began testing missiles with longer ranges. In 2006, they conducted their first test with a nuclear warhead. This was repeated in 2009. And then under Kim Jong-un, the testing intensified. The nuclear arsenal of North Korea is believed to now range between 35 and 65 warheads, which is today's ultimate deterrent. The complicated geography, the fear of escalation, the lack of international consensus, domestic opposition and the potential humanitarian crisis have influenced the United States' decision to take a diplomatic route. And this is leveraged by North Korea's leader. In one memo, their method is described as being obstreperous, applying pressure and then relenting in the end. And this is still very common in North Korean politics. First, they raise tensions and come off as unpredictable and dangerous. But then they get aid and they go on a charm offensive until things cool down for a short period of time. Check out one of these two videos next.